Hi, I'm Mark Oliver with the National Shooting Sports Foundation. With me I have Sean Davis of The Federalist and I have Ryan Kleckner of GunUniversity.com. I appreciate you guys coming in. We're going to have just a quick little discussion today about some of the issues that we're seeing happen with gun control measures in the states. I think probably on everybody's mind and in the headlines across the nation has been what's happening in Richmond, Virginia. And Sean, I know that you had some of your folks down there covering what's happening on the ground. What did you see? Right, so we sent one of our reporters down there. Uh, he drove down to Richmond and he spent the whole day there, talked to people, milled about, and what I thought was most remarkable from his report was how little happened. Yeah. We, we know that the media and a lot of uh, gun control politicians were hoping for some sort of spark. They wanted some sort of a, an excuse. Um, to continue cracking down, and what they saw instead was uh, tens of thousands of people getting together peacefully, uh, talking, uh, making new connections, picking up their trash, and not a single arrest. Yeah, and I think when we see this, I mean, the, the expectation was that there's going to be an ignition. Uh, Governor Northern was out there talking about this could be a repeat of Charlottesville from a couple of years ago. Uh, but what we see was a reaction of the people to be involved in the process of of how their laws are made in their states. I mean, isn't this the way that things are supposed to go? Uh, it is. We have an awesome federalist system that allows us to test how laws work in the states, and we can look to the states and see if they work or not before we adopt them federally. And my problem with that, though, is we already have tons of examples of gun control around the country that people seem to be ignoring. I mean, we want to see if gun control works. Look at Chicago. Look at places like New York City. Look at Baltimore. Look at places like that. But you're right, I think uh, people are looking at it right now, and I think if we don't hold fast in Virginia, we should expect other states to follow suit soon. So in Virginia, it was a little bit different. I mean, we saw, you know, at previous to the election, uh, Michael Bloomberg dropped in two and a half million dollars into that state to turn to blue. Mm -hmm. and, and he's looking, I think, for a return on his investment. Uh, Gabby Gifford's gun control group also dropped another 300,000 on top of that. So I mean, is this now something where we're, we're gonna start to see a repeat of this in other state legislatures? Well, the, the great thing about what happened in Virginia is it was a show of political force. Yeah. And it sent a message to the politicians that if you're going to come and try and take away our constitutional rights, there are going to be political consequences. So I, I think it sent a strong message to gun controllers in other states like Minnesota or in Arizona that if you want to do this, there's going to be a political cost to pay. You're not going to get away with this for free, which is a very important, valuable message to send to politicians who generally more than anything care about their election prospects and their careers. Yeah. And when you see 50,000, 30,000 people show up, that tells you, you know, that this is an issue that matters a lot to people and they're not just gonna sit there and take it. And so Ryan, I mean, we've seen this. I mean, in Virginia, there were 120 plus counties and municipalities that passed Second Amendment resolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think the majority, I mean, almost the entire state, with the exception of a few uh, towns, a couple of counties passed these resolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I know in the county where I live in, Prince William County, they, the new Board of Supervisors for the county tried to come in and, and actually turn over theirs, and they were pushed back by, by people showing up at these uh, at the county board meetings. Yep. I mean, and, and we're seeing this not just in Virginia now, we're watching this happen in, in other states. I, mean, I love what, it. What do you see as the, as the ground fire? I mean, this obviously didn't start in Virginia. You saw this happening out in New Mexico and mm -hmm. in Colorado. So what does this say when the people start to become involved and you see them standing up for their, for their rights? Mm -hmm. I love it because have you ever heard of the Barbara Streisand effect where she tried to hide her house on Google Maps and by trying to hide it, it drew more attention to it? That's what's happening with these gun laws. In Virginia, for example, when they're trying to come out with these laws to restrict our rights, all they did is woke people up and made them realize they need to defend their rights even more. I mean, even something so simple as the protest zones where they set up these barricaded fences and said, yeah, you have the right to peacefully assemble as long as you're behind these fences with armed police looking at you and put all these restrictions on it, it woke people up that really maybe not to be caring and paying attention to their constitutional rights, saying, hey, that doesn't seem right over there. Or the argument of nobody's coming for your guns. Well, nothing fixes that than watching people try to come for your guns, and now they're worse off than if they never brought the issue up at all for the anti-gunner side, and I love it. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, I mean, we're not thinking about something that's abstract in Virginia. They, mm -hmm. they introduced some very serious bills. Probably the one that's gotten the most attention was state, uh, Senate Bill 16, which was the outright confiscation of a lawfully yeah. owned fire. Oh, no one's going to come get your guns. What about that? That bill was dropped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that bill has not advanced out through the Senate Judiciary Committee, but we're still looking at other bills. There's a bill out there to ban indoor ranges with employees over 50, and of yeah. course, the, the author of that bill said he targeted that toward the NRA's range. But as we looked at it, our, our own members of National Shooting Sports Foundation, there are at least three other ranges that we know of that are, have more than 50 employees. And we take that as a threat to all 114 ranges in the state. There's another bill that's been introduced in, uh, by a state senator out of Loudoun County that would ban anything that can re resemble an outdoor range. 
And so we have our folks in, in Richmond right now trying to work to make sure that, that language is not going to be harmful to those ranges that are trying to be built or pre-exist, or even just the ability for someone like yourself, Ryan, to be able to go out into the back 40 and shoot yeah. your rifles on your own property in a safe and responsible manner. So, I mean, we start looking at it. I mean, it's not just that. We're looking at there's a bill out there to, to enact age-based uh, gun bans. I mean, anyone under the age of 21. And, Ryan, I mean, this we, we talk about this in the effect of the military, and, and you served. You're a veteran. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we trust these 18-year-olds to join the military, to yeah. pull a firearm, to deploy overseas, and possibly use that firearm right. in the defense of their own nation. Maybe some of those folks are married. They're, they have an 18-, 19-year-old yes. back home. And now we're going to be able to tell them, well, you can't exercise your right to purchase a firearm to protect yourself? Right. I mean, we're... Or smoke. Yeah, I mean... I, 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 I picture it like a, a soundboard with all those switches going up and down for ages. They say, well, smoking, let's do 21. Guns, let's do 21. Voting, let's do 16. Yeah. You're an adult or you're not. We've got to pick when you're an adult. And when you're an adult and can make good decisions, we all need to agree on that, because you can't say you're an adult enough to vote, which arguably might be able to cause more damage with one vote than any person having a firearm can do. Yeah. And, 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 Sean, not, yeah. and kind of on that effect, I mean, we're talking about at 18 years old, you're an American citizen fully vested in your rights. I mean, how dangerous is this kind of precedent? Uh, it's bad because it sets up tiers of citizenship. Sure. So we, we have a nation that's founded on, on uh, ideals and laws, and, and those laws generally are supposed to apply to everyone equally. Yeah. So I remember uh, when I turned 18, signing up for selective service. You know, my government can call me up and send me to war whenever it wants. I can vote. Uh, you know, I can, there, there's all these things you can do when, when you hit that uh, age of maturity and to come in and say, we expect you to fulfill these obligations, but we're not going to acknowledge these rights. It's a really dangerous thing to do because once you start down that path, you have no idea where you're going to end up. Yeah. Yeah. And top of that, it won't solve anything. Yeah. Most of these are done in knee-jerk reactions to a mass shooting or to something. And in every mass shooting you look at, or virtually every mass shooting you look at, an age-based ban would have had zero effect on it. That's even ignoring the fact that you can't make things illegal and expect people to stop doing them, right? So not even that argument. Just the age-based ban, no effect at all. So we're talking about an infringement on our rights and our abilities for a discussion that's not even going to be fruitful. And it's interesting you bring that up, Ryan, because Governor Northam there in Virginia is looking at that as a, a case that studies for us to watch what's happening. Mm -hmm. Governor Northam last year out in uh, the western end of the state I was actually at a forum at one of the colleges and admitted in an open question from a high school student that all the, all the bills that he wanted to push forward in the special session then that are now being introduced again would have done nothing to stop the mass shooting that happened at, Vir at Virginia Beach. Right. That murder happened by somebody who had already passed a background check to buy two firearms, had already passed a, a further background check to possess yeah. that suppressor, which we know means the submission of fingerprints, means that, you know, going, enduring another background check, a notification yeah. to the lawful, uh, chief law enforcement officer, and, in the, in, of course, paying the tax stamp to be able to get that through. So we know that evil is evil, and, and it's going to have to be addressed. And, of course, that happened in the gun-free zone where people weren't allowed to protect themselves. So when we start seeing these little patchwork of laws, how, how confusing does it make it for those like you, Sean, who just want to exercise your right but do it right. lawfully? Right, yeah, so the problem is you, we have two worldviews clashing. Yeah. Uh, and one of those views says, well, if you just eliminate all the tools that evil people might use, there won't be evil anymore. And as we know throughout history and common sense, that there's no basis for that view. And then on the other side are those who believe in individual rights that, you know what, you can't legislate away uh, the intent to do evil in someone's heart, but what you can do is give people the tools they need to protect themselves and their family. And we've seen time and time again the effort to ban tools never works, and all it does is make those who want to defend themselves defenseless. But we're not just looking at this as just a Virginia problem. I mean, is, there's all the problems elsewhere, right? I mean, Ryan, you, you take a look across some of the states. I mean, where else are you seeing these issues pop up? I see it nationally, actually, is when it scares me from the talking points that come out. Um, so we talked earlier already how the other states are looking at Virginia, but I think nothing's better for our gun rights than unsuccessful attempts to take them away. Because it gets, look, look how riled up we are now. Look how many right. sanctuary cities are coming out now. That wouldn't have happened had people tried to take our gun rights. I hope they're unsuccessful, but. Yeah, all across the country, I think we need to be worried about it. I also think at the local level is where it really matters. I know on, on TV and politics, it's so exciting to get riled up about the federal government, but you're going to lose your gun rights fastest at your city, county, or state level. So I, I think it's really important to ask yourself, if you care about gun rights, can you even name your representatives right now? Yeah. You even know who they are, yeah. let alone what their stances are. And it kind of gets to the point. The most important thing that gun owners can do, the most important people in this industry can do, is get out and vote. And that's why the National Shooting Sports Foundation 
started the hashtag gunvote.org website. They're going to give you all the information that you need on who your candidates are, where they stand on the gun issues, where you can go get registered to vote, and where your polling places are. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing that we can do is educate each other, make sure that all of our friends know where everyone stands and what's at risk when we're talking about our, our Second Amendment rights. Absolutely. John, Ryan, I really appreciate you guys coming in today. I know it's been a great day, a great show show so far. I know you guys have both been busy, and I, and I look forward to seeing you all on the floors. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. We'll look forward to seeing you soon again.